talk with you and kind of learn about the ecosystem. The couple of days that I spent in Bangkok were kind of mind blowing. Um, and I just, I'd, I'd love for you to tell your story and the story of your community and, you know, kind of just cross pollinate a little bit more. Sure. All right. Um, well, um, for everybody who doesn't know me, my name is Aim. I uh, have been involved actively in the um, Asian startup ecosystem since about 2012. Uh, mm -hmm. So the claim to fame was starting Thailand's first co-working space back in the days when uh, co-working startups, uh, you know, and, and angel investing wasn't a thing. Um, and, and that story, uh, backstory is really one of scratching my own itch. So I was mm -hmm. a um, struggling um, founder who wanted to build an app uh, and, and coming from a nonprofit background running social enterprise incubators, I kind of vaguely know a thing or two about technology, but you know, didn't really know how to code or didn't really have a network. And we're getting really bad advice from folks that I used to work with, um, these people who were pointing me in the wrong direction. And we had a bunch of ideas and we just realized that we were doing it wrong, that we were going out there in the blind, we're gonna spend all this money that we didn't have to try to build an app that we didn't know if the market needed. So, uh, you know, luckily there was this thing called Google, we did a little bit of research uh, and tried to figure out what people were doing in not just Silicon Valley, but Tel Aviv or, you know, uh, Singapore, Seoul, how do you tech companies get started? And mm. I think reading enough TechCrunch and Medium blogs and uh, all sorts of, um, I think it, was, it wasn't Quora back then, probably Yahoo Answers. Uh, and I came to realize that uh, people didn't start by incorporating. They started by going out to meet like-minded folks in communities like hackers and founders and really jam on the idea, get feedback, find co-founders and maybe some uh, talent and, and angel support. Hmm. So kind of reverse engineering that process, uh, I kind of just thought with, with some of my co-founder uh, maybe let's start with building a co-working space first, then an app. Um, obviously, mm. we kind of underestimated the enormity of the venture that we were getting into. Um, it took twice as long and twice as much. Um, saddled with that by the time we were open uh, in June 2012, uh, we were with a month of runway, no customers in the first month, and we're just freaking out why nobody wanted to sign up despite having 5,000 fans in Facebook and people wow. were just popping in because co-working was this cool new thing they have heard in online and in Silicon Valley. So long story short, uh, we basically did the, you know, uh, kind of cardinal sin of a uh, startup world, which is to build a product nobody needs um, and, and <laughs> didn't talk to any customers. Uh, so we decided that whoever showed up, we were just going to interview them, ask them why they came, why they didn't, what mm -hmm. they thought about it, why they didn't sign up, or, or why they were gravitated towards co-working despite, you know, we were just in business. And uh, quickly we found out that people were there not just for the super fast Wi-Fi and nice uh, kind of hacker house setup um, in our original location. They were there because they felt that they were lonely, they were frustrated building stuff on their own, they, they needed some guidance and support, and they just couldn't find a network of people that thought like them, trying to pursue dreams like them. And then I think that the word nowadays is thrown all over the place, it's community. Um, but we found that uh, for people that in Silicon Valley that experience it all the time, it's, you know, this is how business as usual, but in emerging markets where people were afraid of others stealing an idea or, you know, shady business practices, community was a very foreign concept for strangers. Mm. Uh, and that was then the business that we pivoted into, which is really becoming a community and thus eventually an ecosystem builder. As, as more and more people show up in the space, you realize there was a need for events and angel investor networks and pitch days with VCs and great conferences that brought people across the world. So 
Uh, and then that became the second business, which you see in a Zoom background, Texas. Started in 2015. It's a media company with about 5 million annual readers and uh, a conference of 20,000 people every June, uh, Texas Global Summit. So all that started in the co-working space with about 200 people that showed up in one of our first meetup and it wow. grew exponentially, uh, du doubled the size every year. So and that's where we are. Everything was going you know, swimmingly well and we had ambitious plans in 2020 and all that is uh, thrown out the door and, and we'll be definitely uh, rewriting our, our business plan for this year. No, I hear you. So like, I, I, I'm always amazed when I talk to like community event organizers at how massive a number of these startup events are outside of Silicon Valley. Like, I, do you happen to have numbers of like how large is TechCrunch and how large is Launch? Um, mm. I, I know that Slush, which is yeah. fairly well known out of Helsinki, is about five to 10,000 members, but you guys are 20,000. Yeah, so um, I think uh, Slush is somewhere, yeah, uh, 15 to 20. Okay. Um, and there's Rise in Hong Kong uh, with the part of the Web Summit family, which is about 15,000. So yeah, okay. we, we get close to 20. Um, and, and I think that's just because Bangkok is a very accessible, easy destination and it's very affordable. And most of the time people feel that it's going to be fun. Um, and, and uh, you know, things work in our favor. Uh, we get about 38 million tourists a year. Um, and now we get uh, close to zero. So, uh, and it's 20% of our economy. So uh, exciting times for, for Thailand. No, I, and I want to touch base about kind of how you actually see the ecosystem kind of getting through this. But can you give me like a snapshot of how you feel building a startup in Thailand or Southeast Asia is compared to kind of like what building a startup in like Silicon Valley or in like London or Berlin might actually be? Sure. So, so in, in, Southeast Asia, there's usually a joke, like our founders aren't usually viewed as um, unicorns or, you know, uh, like the future living Buddhas and, and, and Messiahs. They're really viewed as cockroaches. Um, and then there's that, <laughs> literally a, a group, uh, and I'm sure all of you have heard of this a lot. It says um, these, these founders are resilient. Uh, you can hit them how many times and they just won't die. They just keep coming back. Um, and that's what it takes to launch a startup here in emerging markets, which where mm. people are unfamiliar with technology in general. Um, and then we're always happy with the pen and paper. Um, and IT was viewed as a cost, not as an investment for growth uh, traditionally. Mm. And um, you know, computer literacy uh, was pretty low. And, and I think all that factors um, were what used to happen when we were starting out. We were trying to tell people why it was important to invest in startups and talent. And all these things changed a lot. And, and you know, the world is getting very small as young people are jaded from the traditional corporate boring jobs that see their friends working in uh, Facebook and Google and, and whatnot uh, with incredible offices and experiences Many of them studied abroad, many of them coming back. Uh, people started to have options with job platforms and LinkedIn. So uh, large enterprises and, and corporations and, and SMEs alike are freaking out that young people don't stick around long enough or don't want even to join their companies. Mm. So there's definitely a shortage of talent um, just because talent now is very mobile. Um, mm -hmm. The infrastructure for most countries in Southeast Asia is surprisingly great. You get 5G already, you know. Really? Um, the, yep. Um, and it's starting to roll out. We've got um, like gigabit uh, broadband. Uh, and, and I think a lot of people are quite surprised that sometimes the internet speed is, is faster in Europe and in some parts of the US. So all that was to really kind of leapfrog from desktop and, and going straight to mobile, 
which is uh, opening a lot of um, avenues and opportunities for business models that are, you know, emerging market first because the mobile phone is everyone's essentially their first computer. Mm. Um, we're also seeing this massive um, shift in terms of uh, different countries that can't out manufacture China or, or kind of the low cost market. Um, countries like Thailand are just having this soul searching and saying that, well, we've got maybe an aging population that's uh, uh, you know shrinking workforce, it's getting expensive and we just can't do lower value stuff. So how do we transform the economy without becoming obsolete? And a lot of countries are governments, I think far and wide across the world are moving into creative industries, services, and also tech. Mm -hmm. So that kind of quick shift um, and, and quick thinking for, for many governments, uh, you know, it, it's a necessary move for, for survival. So we, we're quite fortunate that after beating the drum for four years in Thailand, the government agencies all got around together and said that they were gonna push hard on this vision called Thailand 4.0. Mm -hmm. And just becoming more of a, you know, both a developed nation in 10 years and a, a innovation and a creative hub. Wow. So through that transformation uh, and, and government policy, um, we've got a lot of these large corporates and enterprise. And this one of the things that's very unique about Thailand hmm. um, is our corporate ecosystem is probably the strongest in the region where large, mm -hmm. uh, both the companies that have been around over 100 years, state-owned enterprises, and, and mostly led by telcos and banks, but a lot of it, but now all the blue chip companies are saying, we need to retain talent, we need to, you know, not be caught off guard of disruption, and we are going to innovate to the point that we want to build our own unicorns. So three banks have came and said that they were going to venture build Thailand's first unicorn, and then that, that's wow. a ballsy move that's unique from the rest of the region and uh, goes to show that, you know, some e ecosystems are government led um, and in Thailand it's private sector led. Uh, wow. No, that's actually really interesting. How do you, I, I know that coronavirus is kind of devastating the world's economy. There's massive changes. I've talked with a number of corporates, a number of startups, everybody is kind of struggling to kind of stay afloat. Um, I, I've talked with a number of startups that are kind of in the remote workspace, the healthcare space that are just exploding right now. Um, some of them, like tourism, hospitality kind of focused startups are just getting devastated. Um, how you mentioned briefly that, you know, like 20% of Thailand's economy was tourism and that was taking a huge hit. Um, how do you actually also, how do you see coronavirus kind of affecting things? Um, in the next six, 12 months. Mm. Yeah, well, I, I've got this stat on bank, uh, the Bangkok Post from the Joint Standing Committee of Commerce Industry and Banking. Seven millions might be out of job by June because of the shutdown of the pandemic. That's 10% of the workforce. And now that seven million, there's going to be at least, uh, let me see the number, 4.2 million in retail, a million people in the hotel industry, 200,000 in the spa and massage, 250,000 in restaurants. So I think the keyword and the hashtag for the next uh, three to 24 months, uh, depending on how long this lasts, is a pandemic pivot uh, <laughs> yeah, or the I great adaptivity. Yeah. <laughs> Pandemic pivot, hashtag pandemic pivot. I like yeah, that. Yeah, or, or this thing I've heard, a pandemic market fit. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I know, I know. Well, uh, you know, I, I'm not the first one to think of it. So uh, Twitter, uh, I give credit to the, the Twitter Rotties. Um Long story short, I think uh, definitely a complete change in the business model for a short or maybe long term, um, mm. just because we're, we're going into a deep, deep recession. Uh, people aren't going to spend on travel and luxury and, and uh, consumer behavior is, is going to change. And I think uh, they now call on this generation, generation virtual. Mm -hmm. So, you know, certain stocks will do well, like the platform we're on at the moment. But also, uh, I think um, you know, we, we have 
startups that were doing B2B um, logistics and supplying for restaurants. And now they're doing mm. B2C for groceries. You had oh, startups wow. that were doing the on-demand um, home care uh, and the maids. And now it's on-demand uh, uh, sanitization of mm. offices and commercial properties. You've got companies that were making shirts and now making masks. And, you know, there's a ton of those. Well, so, so I think, uh, you know, there's, there's really four major OKRs that every company needs to think about right now. It's one, it's grab cash. And then second is lower burn. And third is don't get infected. <laughs> uh, and the last one, yeah, I mean, if, if, if you get it, then you can't make any cash or factories shut or, yep. you know, the office is closed. And then lastly is find new business models that don't cost a thing to test out. And, uh, you know, we've got startups that are willing to rent their teams, get into venture building, uh, grab consulting gigs, uh, do whatever it takes. Some even just pivot to become an influencer marketer. Mm. But whatever is needed to keep the lights on, keep the team together, mm -hmm. ride it out until better days and, and not cut too deep until you don't have a business on the way out mm. uh, is probably where most people are thinking. But definitely there's already been massive uh, layoffs in any startups related to travel and or the hospitality industry. Yeah. Um, if you had a magic wand and could change three things about the startup ecosystem in Thailand um, in the next three to five years, what would that be? Great question, actually. I think one, one of the fundamentals uh, that is really hampering the growth of the ecosystem is, is a lack of talent. And, um, you know, we, we have to bid highly uh, both against all of our corporate part, uh, partners that invest in our conferences are throwing, um, I've heard 6X, I've heard 10X salary packages um, for um, startup employees because wow. they're trying to suck up all the talent. Uh, and then it's, you know, no fault of their own. It's a very tight labor market. Uh, and, and many companies are not used to, you know, remote workers and outsourcing to other countries. So I think uh, because of that, and there's very few graduate of computer science, uh, we haven't seen an explosion of dev boot camps and mm. uh, training courses. But in many countries like Singapore and Malaysia, there's a lot of incentives for reskilling. So the government will give you subsidies mm. and vouchers for people to take courses online or go, go in and uh, you know, retrain themselves. And I think Thailand needs something like that because we need mm. more quality and quantity of people interested to work in the tech industry. Mm -hmm. And through that, then we'll have a lot of opportunities for uh, startups and large enterprises alike to be able to bring in a lot of great talent that uh, without just overpaying, and that's hurting a lot of businesses and why they have to shed a lot of their most expensive headcount. Yeah. So, so with more talent, I think, um, then you have this, this issue, there's all these people with skills that they might be underemployed or unemployed at the moment just because mm. very few are hiring. So yeah. I think um, the next one is, is really to make it uh, much easier and lower friction for people to start and launch companies. Mm. And tell them we don't have like crazy incorporation laws uh, but definitely taxes are still an issue uh, and there's some tax breaks but most companies prefer to incorporate in Singapore because of the lack of capital gains tax and, and mm. just the ease of doing business and raising funding there and and obviously if there's an exit there's capital gains um, and, and that that means that uh, a lot of the um, investors are hesitant to invest in a Thai and corporate company. Mm. Uh, we don't have incentives or the right structure to get a lot of people to start venture capital funds. Um, mm -hmm. And many countries kickstart that with matching grants or investment from the government, um, all sorts of 
uh, kind of incentives and training to get more people to become angel investors and VCs, tax breaks, uh, whatnot. Uh, we haven't seen a lot, a ton of that. Mm. So absent of independent private angel investors and funds, we have a lot of CVCs, corporate mm. venture capital, which by default are conservative. You know, they may appear young ho and ballsy up front, but there's an investment community. Uh, there's a you know stock market and shareholders to consider and things take a long time. And most of the companies that are getting funded are kind of the, you know, de-risk um, kind of sure home runs, or at least it's it's going to land somewhere nice. So Series mm. A and above, and a lot of companies die in the valley of death. So um, mm. kind of pre-seed to seed, uh, and nobody's kind of picking up the slack. And, and you know, because of all the friction, like I said, um, you know, uh, hard to get government grants. They're kind of on the small side. Um, and, and just the, the amount of effort that startups and, and hoops that they need to go through to, to survive. We've had companies that go through like three to five accelerators just to cobble enough of kind of seed capital to get going. And I think there's a lot of room for more uh, better accelerators and incubators. And that'd be my third point, which is, mm. I think as a startup ecosystem builder, we are not that much supported to do the work that we do eight years in we you know we get some um, love and support from corporate governments and corporates but in order to scale up and not to serve bangkok but serve across the country we definitely need uh, more firepower and, and i think a lot of co-working spaces and accelerators are often seen as you know doing great work people pat us on the back and say hey good job keep doing this but when it comes to like, okay, so are you going to invest in our fund or, you know, are you going to help us out? Um, we get some love from, you know, actual like ex-entrepreneurs and C-suites. But when it comes to like, you know, large amounts of capital or support, um, it's been taking a long time. Yeah. Uh, and I think because of that kind of cautious measured approach with um, trying not to fail, trying not to be embarrassed, um, these corporates have, um, and, and a lot of our partners spend too long of a time overthinking of what they should be doing mm. and not enough time doing. And then mm -hmm. when we have this kind of crisis, then everybody's coming to ask us, like, how do we go remote? How do we transform ourselves? But, you know, you're transforming in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, and then it's hard to do that when you have to keep the lights on. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Um, in terms of um, Texas, in terms of your co-working space, um, what's helpful to you personally in the next uh, one, three, six months? Yeah, so with the conference uh, originally scheduled for June uh, and we've moved to 5th and 6th of October, uh, we're definitely going through a lot of experimentation as everybody's moving their stuff uh, virtually online. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that we're starting to experiment with some of the tools out there and seeing if the experience um, can be kind of a, you know, a, a teaser and then a stopgap measure just to keep our, our community and our, our fans entertained. Mm -hmm. That said, we, we, we definitely, you know, all all of us in the event industry are in this big grand experiment together. Are we going full virtual? Are we still going to focus on that kind of concert-like experience-rich uh, physical event? Is it going to be a hybrid and scale beyond, you know, 100, you know, like 150,000 people and with, with social distancing? So now, you know, everybody doesn't need to show up and, and yeah. all that. So I think it's going to be a little bit of both, but definitely love love for that support um, for all of our online events. If it's relevant, just check out our, our website. But but in general, um, I think with both Texas and and how about my co-working space, uh, we just need our community to you know kind of tell us what you're struggling, how can we help, what uh, you know ways that our services, which were mostly uh, offline and in-person, now can be translated online. And, and I think we're doing a lot of 
you know, a strategizing in terms of uh, which of our products and services that we can offer virtually uh, and, and, and pivot in that space as well. Uh, and, and that that would basically be coming from what our members need. Because there's a plethora of, of remote working tools and then people are getting comfortable upgrading their office and, uh, you know, they've got their blue microphones and 4K <laughs> video camera. So now once people kind of realize that they can work from home, you know, one of the things that even we work and all the biggest co-working space chain in the world have never figured out which which is building a truly virtual supportive community mm. honestly throw everybody on slack and have a few kind of little app integrations get people to do virtual copies and all that yeah. but it really hasn't nobody has nailed it what happens if all of us go remote or all of us get used to being part-time remote and popping into the co-working space. And how do we continue to maintain mm. uh, great communication, community, grow our network? Yeah. So I'm literally going through this personal experiment myself, mm. you know, learning stuff online, using hundreds of apps to see how I can schedule better, do random networking, attend events, uh, be more productive. You know, and, and while meditating, doing yoga, nice. uh, learning Chinese, um, and then really embracing that remote working uh, kind of spirit. But mm -hmm. uh, I think the best iteration of a co-working space or a virtual commuting conference is yet to come. And then hopefully, once somebody nails it, it could be the the community that all of us uh, are are on and, and connected and jamming. And, doing deals and raising funding from. Yeah. Uh, so looking forward to to see that community, which hopefully respects privacy and data. And, and data. <laughs> Imagine um, that an online yeah. community that respects privacy and data. No, mm -hmm. it, it has been, it's been very interesting to me. Um, I don't think I've actually been busier for like a year or two, A, just because yes, we're doing a bit of that pivot. Um, and at the same time, um, the level of access that we've actually had now that the whole world is working remotely, mm -hmm. now that the whole world is getting forcing to being used to Zoom meetings, they're like, mm -hmm. oh, this is actually kind of nice. I'm actually fairly productive. Um, exactly. So we've had a lot of senior level exec meetings um, in the last couple of weeks and business is transacting a lot faster as well. And so sure. I, I was talking to a, a, a senior executive financial institution and, and they were on the you know social impact space and one of the things that she actually said which shocked me is she says you know what um like chaos is opportunity yep. and there's going to be a lot of interesting things that are you know everybody is slammed forced to actually make some dramatic changes in how they work and what they work um mm -hmm. and i think that there's going to be a lot of very interesting startups that are actually launched to this downturn um but hey, I really thank you for your time. Thank you so much for building the ecosystem and building the community. I know personally um, what a giant pain in the butt that is. Um, mm -hmm. And so thank you. It's a delight to talk with you. If people actually want to learn more about uh, the Bangkok ecosystem, the Southeast Asia startup ecosystem, um, where would they go? How do they find you? How do they find your media? Um, and so... Plug what you guys plug what you're doing and how people is it texas.com uh, it's dot co and then the english edition is a slash en okay and yeah join our five million readers uh and the, the summit which you see in the background is uh the website summit.texas.co mm -hmm. and for our co-working space whenever uh covid um comes around uh you're more than welcome to check us out it's world wide web hubba thailand.com uh, awesome. Yes, and thank you uh, for having me. I can't wait to meet the rest of the Kirsten Founders family. And John, uh, stay safe, stay healthy, uh, and everybody out there. I know it's tough times, uh, but now is the best time to activate your community. All that networking, all the help, all the coffee meetings and picking your brains that you've invested in. Uh, this is the time to kind of draw some of that balance and say you're struggling you're hurt you need you need some time and then people like myself and john 
are we here to support you? But for folks that have never really invested in that balance sheet and, and bank account of goodwill uh, and feel like there's no community to back them up and support them, now is also the best time to start yes. building a community. No, I, I love that. And in, in something tells me that, you know, in, in, during a nuclear winter, is where mm -hmm. cockroaches rule. And so um, here, sir, is to the generation of cockroach startup kings. Awesome. Cheers to that. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. And um, that right, was so fantastic. Done. Yeah, great. I think right. uh, no, I didn't admit it. All right. <laughs> that was Thank fantastic. You. Um, you can do and, more and, anytime. Yeah.